Hey guys, welcome back. It's your favorite Gimp of the Limp. And this part, part two, might be a little bit shorter than uh, it previously would have been because this is actually the second time I'm filming this because the first time I filmed it, unfortunately, the audio did not take. So all I had was a whole lot of this with no sound. And the way the game plays, since I play the games actually in front of you guys and I don't like stage it, I couldn't really do an audio dub back over top of it. So what I did was I went and redrew back my hand of cards that I played, got everything set back up the way it was prior to filming it. That way I could kind of film it again, but I already know what's going to happen. I already know what I'm playing and all that, so it will be a little bit quicker. But uh, the first time I filmed this, I did talk a little bit about the Robota and my thoughts on that because some people have been talking about it. So skip forward a few minutes if you're not wanting to hear about my thoughts when it comes to the Robota system. But I did want to address that because uh, a lot of people had concerns. All right, so here's the short version of my opinion of the Robota system at this point. Here's the thing. Companies have to have a solo module for their games now. It's, it's almost expected. Every damn Kickstarter I see... Solo compatible, solo this, solo AI, solo card pack, whatever. People want it. They expect it. I want it. I demand it. I, I get it. So I understand that the companies are trying to appease demand because so many people play it solitaire. And especially when it comes to war gamers, war gamers are huge when it comes to solitaire play. I mean, they're, they're huge when it comes to competitive play too, but especially the link that some of these games can go to. I mean, when you talk about like Thunder in the East, which can take weeks to play through, you know, just a single campaign, you know, that stuff like that can take a while, but being able to play it solitaire and leave it on your table and, and come back to it whenever you like, you know, that's part of the reason we do this. I mean, it's part of the reason board gamers started two-handing it back in the, the 70s. Here's the thing, because of that demand, Companies are, you know, kind of force fitting robot systems into games that maybe uh, they wouldn't have back in the day. Uh, it just it kind of depends. But we do want it. We do expect it. And a lot of times they do go with something like a card system to try to automate the robot now or the AI. I'm calling it robot because that's what it is in this game. My thing with this robot is the fact that it is very, very fiddly. OK. And the thing is, is I don't blame GMT or the game designer for it because there really isn't any other option to handle it. You can't really just flowchart it. it. The game can't have a hand of cards and it can't really operate off of what's written on the cards themselves. So they had to come up with a way that the game could operate a tank for the most part on its own with the deck but not really operating off the deck because the ai isn't going to know whether it has move whatever level card in its hand or a fire level card in its hand or terrain cards it's not going to know that so it can't really operate off of that they went with the best thing that they could which was to automate based off of these target numbers and come up with an idea of how to generate success levels, which is basically how many cards the AI is playing for whatever type of action. And they came up with these robotic cards for the AI to have a priority list of actions that it's going to try to do these things first. It's going to try to protect itself or to take out an enemy if it has a good shot lined up or, or move, you know, just whatever the situation could possibly dictate. And you got to give it to them. They did come up with two sides of the card, whether or not the AI is in good position or if it's in a bad position because it's in peril and a way to keep track of that. You know, both sides of the cards, what types of actions it's going to take. And then even different behavior levels for these cards because uh, you see you've got alert, cautious, bold, another alert, aggressive, evasive, cautious. So you could include different cards into the deck depending on if you wanted the AI to be more defensive or more aggressive or if you wanted it to be just generic, you could just use the alert cards. So they did include options with it. But like I said, my thing with it just comes down to the fiddly nature of it. You guys watch me. I filmed just 
the Robata. And yes, I was walking through it very slow, but there's still so many steps that you got to take each turn uh, with the AI and the fact that you're having to lay out these cards, you're having to compare the number, then you're having to have the numbers and compare them to its level determine how many success levels that it has and like, okay, it has this many success levels, so it's going to do this action. And then on top of that, you're having to look at, did it get leadership cards? Did it get terrain cards? Did it get command cards? And if any of those things are true, then you have extra steps that you have to add on top of it. You're either going to like this robotic system or you're not. Okay. The, I don't think that this one has a, a whole lot of in-between. This one is going to be for someone who doesn't mind fiddly, who doesn't mind a whole lot of hands-on, that wants a system that takes as much control of the AI as possible. If you're one of those people, this Robota probably is not going to bother you because it does do a relatively good job of taking control of the tank. You don't have to make many, you know, I think the AI would do this kind of judgment calls when it comes to this AI system. I don't think there's any AI system in which you're not going to have to make any. Occasionally, you're going to have to make some. I don't think anyone could create one that will be perfect for every possible situation, especially in a game like this where it's very, very abstracted. But if you're someone who does not want an AI system that has this much level of detail to it, uh, this many steps, it might not be one for you. It, you might prefer the, the ones that just have a a card that say it'll do this, then this, then this, then this, you know, and you just go with the first one that's applicable, not having to worry about drawing out cards, comparing numbers, determining the success levels. This whole success level thing, personally, I think it's an ingenious way of having the Robota activate and, and work. But like I said, it's, it's very, very fiddly. You just have so many steps and so many little things that you're having to keep track of. It's kind of like the, the 0.5 version of the game. You, you already learned the base game, but now you've got to learn the, the extra game on top of it to have this portion of the game work. So for me, when it comes down to this type of robot, I, I'm, I can kind of be in the middle on it. The way I kind of view it is, I would have to be in the right mood to do this. If I'm wanting something easy to throw on the table and something I don't have to think too hard about, then this probably isn't the Robota for me. This isn't the one that I'm going to you know, jump for right off the bat because there are so many steps and so many little things to, to keep track of. But if, in my, if I'm in the mood to sink my teeth into something and, and really get stuck into a game and don't mind drawing out the cards, figuring it out, you know, having those extra steps, then the robot is there. But for me, I could see this one either way and play it, not play it. I could two hand it. it. It wouldn't matter to me, but it's going to be up to you on what type of gamer you are. After seeing this in action, the robot system, you'll know whether or not it's a system that you would like to try or you would like to get your hands on or if it's one that might be a little bit too much hands-on for you and you'd rather like an uh, easier and more streamlined system. So yeah, my general thoughts about it is it's not bad. Like I said, I think it's ingenious for what they had to come up with, with what they were working with to get the system to work as much on its own as it does. I just think there's a lot of steps involved with that that will turn off certain players and definitely drives up the complexity of the game. All right, so let's get back to my turn. And here's the thing. We're going to play through my turn real quick, and I'll probably cut the video at that point um, since it was a little bit longer <laughs> when I did it the first time because obviously I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, but we already, I already know what I'm going to be doing on my turn. So here's the thing. The Robota moved up in the previous turn. It got into the red section. It closed the gap with me. Obviously, I'm wanting to do the same because if I can get closer, I can do some uh, damage to it. But the Robota left off and it was moving. The uh, move card, its generic Robota move card, was there. And looking at my cards, there's one that I'm going to discard later on. But I have a mud card, a building card, and two move cards that I can play. All right. Well, the building card is a terrain card that will help me. So I obviously want to use that. And the move cards will allow me to get closer so I can get a better firing solution on the next turn. And if I can get within 800 yards or meters, whatever it is for this, 
uh, of the enemy, then I needed to hit number of 82. That's actually not too bad. That's a, a pretty decent shot. So moving up a couple of times is a good idea to me. Now, when I played this the first time, I also had the idea of do, playing the mud card on the AI as a field action. I was trying to decide whether I wanted to move first or play the field card first or do the field action rather first because you can do it either way. You have as many field actions as you want, but only one main action. On the back of the player aid, it does list down all the different types of actions that you can play and then field actions down here at the bottom, like playing a terrain card on an enemy when they're in motion. I decided that I would take and play the card on the enemy. And since I already reset this back up, I already know what's gonna happen. I play the mud card here, right? And it replaces its move card. And this is to hopefully cause the enemy to get stuck in the mud and bog down. And when you look at this card, it says bog 10. And it's in one of those highlighted zones, which signifies the fact that you have to check to see if something happens or it automatically happens when you're playing this card. Like, see how it has fire nine, it says spotted with no number next to it. Again, that means you're automatically spotted if you fire. But since we're playing Bog, we have to draw a card and we know that, oops, the card's going to be a 55 and he does not get bogged down, unfortunately, which sucks because I was kind of hoping that he would get bogged down when I played this. But this is still good because mud is not good terrain for a tank, but it still slows him up a little bit. That was my field action, but I still have the ability to play a, a, a tank action. I could play more field actions. But I decided for my actual tank action that I wanted to try to get closer and hopefully go first on the following turn because now we'll be in a good position to shoot at each other and try to cause some damage. So you can play up to three cards, generally speaking, up to three cards for a tank action with the action getting better the more cards that you play. I decided I would play a move one, a move four, and a building card, a terrain card, because that puts me in good terrain. I did have one other move card left, this move seven, but unfortunately my move is only a six, so it's not gonna be any good for me. I won't be able to, to actually move. But with this, this allows me to move twice, so 400 meters, and that gets me into this red zone, so I'm gonna have extra cards. I get an extra card on the next turn, but he's gonna be drawing extra cards based on the, the robot. So I go one, two, boom, buckle my shoe, I've moved up, this is good. Not gonna worry about these. Normally you would leave one of those move cards here if you were just playing the move action, but I did the move terrain action, and you can see here on followed by flank or terrain, you can attempt to flank, which would give me a better chance of hitting the opponent when you're playing the move cards, but I didn't have any flank cards. Or you can try to get yourself into a better position by playing some terrain. Now, if I had just finished with a move on this turn and the next turn I had terrain, I could play this as my just tank action stopping my move and replacing it with terrain. But I'm playing this all together as one string. And now I'm in some buildings, getting some cover. And you can see by looking on the card that it gives me a natural cover of 15, which is good because that hurts his chance of hitting me. And he has to take that into account when he's choosing his actions on whether or not he has a high quality, low quality shot, shit like that. And I have the chance to go, go hull down if I play certain types of cards, like leadership cards, things like that. Again, it says 15 next to it, and that has to do with the chance of going hull down all due to drawing from the deck. But at the bottom of it, it says conceal 20. And this means, and this means that it gives me the chance to be concealed from his view and no longer be spotted by the enemy. So when you have something like this that automatically happens when you play the card and a number, you have to draw a card from your uh, battle deck just like we did for his bog and see if it's equal to or under that number. 
Well, let's draw and bam, 18. All right. Who knew that was going to happen? <laughs> Gippy did because he played this twice already. <laughs> so I was really happy about that. It means I was able to conceal. So he loses his spot. And now I have him spotted without him having me spotted. And if my cards go right on the following turn, I will be able to shoot him at a good range where I've got cover. So I'm actually in a, a fairly good position. This is why I was so upset <laughs> that the damn thing didn't record because I was like, oh, wow, I'm playing well. What the hell? You know, I didn't want to have to redo this. So that completed my tank action. But I could continue to play field actions as I desired at this point. I don't have anything left except for a single move seven card. Now, this card does have a bonus that it has an order icon up here in the upper right that can be used for numerous different benefits. But I decided I wanted to have the best chance of having a good hand of cards on the next turn. So during my discard step, which is where you finish off on your tank actions, you do your administration, your action. Oh, and I forgot about the administration stuff. I went over this in detail the first time I played this. Short version when it comes to the administration step on your turn, this is when you're checking your smoke status, your on fire status, your morale status, seeing if any of these things cause your tank to burn up or your guys to bail out, stuff like that. But a lot of this is gonna happen after you've gotten stuck in, took some shots and damage. Obviously, none of that was going on with my tank yet because I was just starting out. So that's the administration step. But you do finish off with a discard step. I did decide to discard this card in the hopes that I would have a better, better card to play on the following turn. Hopefully give me a chance to get first player by having a low initiative card and then shoot at my opponent, hopefully taking him out. All right, and again, sorry that the video got messed up and I got slowed up a little bit. I was so mad when I, when I uh, went to edit it and the damn thing had no sound. It was like it had been plugged in wrong. I checked it this time, though, so we should be good. Uh, we'll pick back up on this with the next turn with me drawing my hand and hopefully going first and we'll see some uh, fire attacks coming from me and probably from the Robota. I want you guys to see how it works both ways. And again, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, all that good stuff, feel free to put it down below and I'll help out as I can. All right, that's going to be it for this one. You guys take care. I'll catch you in the next one.